gentle and of course very modern apes. I hope you're enjoying the audio. New mic, new me. I'm trying to keep things a little bit less uh, crunchy audio wise considering I, half the complaints I get about the channel are about my bad audio which is which is fair and true. I thought I would come to you today given the last video went over so well and seemed to be helpful for so many people uh, with another five things that I think makes young earth creationism impossible. One might perhaps call this video five more reasons why young earth creationism is impossible. For those of you who may not know out there in the internet, young earth creationism is the belief held by many sort of evangelical religious folks here in the United States and other places, but mostly here, that the earth is approximately 6,000 years old and that life was created more or less in its present form with minimal change at that point by God. And also that 4,400 years ago, there was this big global flood of Noah, Noah's Ark, uh, that is responsible for most of the geologic column and the fossil record that we are exposed to today. So naturally, young Earth creationists are not going to be huge fans of the conventional age given to the Earth, which is 4.5 to 4.8 billion years old, nor are they going to be super <laughs> down with evolutionary theory. The last time you guys were here, I went over my first five reasons why young Earth creation is impossible, which included the heat problem, hominin transition, fossils, so the human evolution, fossil support uh, and genetic support, as well as general statistics uh, and genetic lines between organisms and of course the fossil fuel industry, all of which in one way or another unite life under this big single tree pattern or make a young earth interpretation of our world fairly impossible, hence the title. So today in our five additional reasons why I personally think that young earth creationism is impossible and I think that I can back this up with a fairly decent glut of empirical uh, sources is going to be <laughs> a doozy uh, Earth's tilt and precession around the sun. So let's get into the weeds a little bit on this. How does the tilt of the Earth, which is approximately 23 or 24 degrees on its axis, and its rotation around the sun, what does that actually have to do with young Earth creationism? And bear with me because this one is actually a doozy and I've should be bringing it up more often, and you guys should too, because this one has not, to my knowledge, been tackled by any young earth creationists out there, and it really deep sixes the whole idea. Let's get into this a bit. So Earth, like I said, it's tilted on its axis, and this was potentially because of a collision with the ancient planet Theia, like at the very beginning of the formation of the planet, approximately, again, 4.8 billion years ago. And Theia is now mostly our moon, and this is perhaps what knocked us from a normal straight up and down orbit to a slight tilt. But it is that tilt that actually gives us seasons here on the planet. The seasons are driven by sun exposure, which influences like precipitation patterns all over the world. It's what give us what gives us rather winter and summer here in the northern and southern hemisphere, more close to the poles, and also it's what causes the monsoon seasons along the equator, so the wet and dry season. So to summarize so far, tilt of the earth is what influences the seasonality of our planet, and that seasonality actually leaves its mark quite consistently in the rock record, because it's not just the yearly seasons, it's also large scale climatic patterns and things like glaciation that are completely controlled by the tilt of the earth and where it's at in its precession around the sun. I think this graphic explains really well, really how this works. So in certain areas on the planet, right, given the tilt of the earth, when they're experiencing the summer seasons or the wet season, the sun is more intense in these locations. And as the sun beats down onto the land, the land actually heats up faster than the water does, or rather the land, uh, the air over the land heats up faster than the water does. So as this air over the continents heats, it actually rises up and expands. And when it does that, it creates what's called a pressure differential. That pressure differential is what pulls the water vapor from over the oceans, as you can see here, and it's what causes that heavy precipitation in these areas along the equator that experience the monsoons. In the winter, the opposite is what's happening, which is why they undergo the dry season. But even though the monsoons are yearly, 
regularly at the equator, over long periods of time, they're expected to change in intensity given where the Earth is at in its tilt and precession around the Sun. And this process is expected to occur every 23,000 years, or rather it's to complete its entire cycle of intense and weak monsoons in the northern and southern hemispheres respectively. This is what's known formally as the orbital monsoon hypothesis. And like I said in my other video, it creates this incredible prediction for this ancient age of the Earth. And what I mean by incredible prediction is that before the orbital monsoon hypothesis was actually tested, they laid out what they thought we should see if they are indeed correct, and that this monsoon tempo changes at 23,000 year increments, which would of course mean the Earth cannot be 6,000 years old. And we'll get to that a little bit more in just a second. But here was the prediction, right? This is the conceptual model. Increases in summer insulation heating above a critical threshold value drive the strong monsoon response at the 23,000 year tempo of orbital precession. The amplitude of this strong monsoon response is related to the size of the increase in the summer insulation forcing. And you see you've got like this nice squiggle line and these big humps occur uh, at 23,000 year increments. So with that nice prediction in place, what do we actually see? Is the orbital monsoon hypothesis and the tilt of the earth validated and problematic for young earth creationism. Yes, allow me to set up the joke and hit you with the punchline. So in this goofy drawing that I've done of uh, Earth here, the smiley face is the section of the planet that is exposed to the sun and the frowny face is when it is not. So you can see because of the tilt of the Earth, the northern hemisphere is more exposed to the sun at some points and the southern hemisphere is more exposed to the sun at others. That means that this is of course what is again driving the seasons. What this also means is that when we get certain signals in the northern hemisphere, we should see the inverse of the signal in the southern hemisphere because it is effectively experiencing the opposite, if that makes any sense. Which is why, of course, when it's summer in, you know, the United States or Europe, it is winter in places like Australia or South America. This is just the reality of the world that we live in today. So how do we actually test this? I'm so glad you asked. When it rains, and this is, of course, something that is very important for things like monsoons, because monsoons are effectively big, heavy storms, the water actually percolates down into the ground and ends up sometimes landing in caves, right? Percolates through the ceiling of the cave and it drips off of the ceiling. And that's what creates those nice stalactites and stalagmites that are our little, you know, teeth of the cave. Everyone knows what these guys are, right? <laughs> um, and the cool thing about this is as the water percolates down, it picks up signatures, isotopic signatures of oxygen to be correct, ratios of oxygen 18 to oxygen 16, which can tell us a little bit about the climate at any given time. So let's say we wanted to look back to a signature that the secular community would consider to be 23,000 years ago. We could look at the ratio of oxygen 18 to 16 and know whether or not this was deposited at a summer or winter interval. And we can actually take successive slices of stalactites and stalagmites, which are composed of calcite. That's how the water that percolates down actually turns into a stalactite or stalagmite, right? And we can look at where we're at in the orbital monsoon cycle, the precession of the Earth itself, by comparing it to other slices. And what we should see is what we saw in that conceptual model. We should see a squiggly line as we take successive samples as the orbital monsoon hypothesis carries out its sort of cyclic um, march, if you will, and as the climate changes to being drier or more moist. But the real kicker, is that we should see the inverse in caves in the north versus caves in the south, hemisphere-wise. When the northern hemisphere is signaling that we're getting an intense monsoon season, the southern hemisphere should be signaling that we're getting an intense dry season and vice versa. So naturally what scientists should do is they should test the orbital monsoon hypothesis by sampling stalactites and stalagmites from caves in the northern and southern hemisphere, like perhaps the countries of China versus the countries of Brazil. I wonder if they've done that. So <laughs> here is the data of Brazil caves contrasted with Chinese caves. And these are the oxygen 18 signals that are taken from these calcite cave deposits in quick succession in order to map 
whether or not the orbital monsoon hypothesis is being followed. And lo and behold, not only is it being followed, but it's been continuing its same respective march for 160,000 years in the Chinese records and 120,000 years in the Brazilian records. And because these are northern and southern caves and we expect them to be the inverse, uh, what do we find? Precisely that. <laughs> As the monsoon, as the content of oxygen 18 goes up and gets higher in Brazil, it gets lower in China and vice versa, just as was predicted by the orbital monsoon hypothesis. It says calcite from cave deposits in China and Brazil show oxygen 18 changes produced by variations in the strength of monsoonal air masses at 23,000 year precessional intervals in the cycle. The oxygen 18 variations have the phase of midsummer insulation in each hemisphere. And um, that is just a beautiful representation of good science, really and truly. This was a prediction that was set out. Um, the experiments were carried out, and then we saw the results, and lo and behold, they match precisely the model that was sort of outlined in the beginning. So at this point, you might be thinking, okay, so what? Uh, why does this matter? It shows that the Earth is 23,000 years old at least, uh, and in the case of that data, it's at least 120 or 160,000 years old. Um, fine. What is, again, how does this specifically, why is this so devastating to younger creations? I and mean, we have plenty of things that say the Earth is at least that old. And it's because of the nature of this process. It's the nature of how these specific signals are actually recorded. Because in order to have this inverted cycle, we have to have inverted seasons. And in order to have inverted seasons, we have to have the tilt of the Earth. And in order to validate the processional or the orbital monsoon hypothesis and its precession, it has to proceed at the specific rate that is recording uh, signals in these 23,000 year increments. And what that means is that for young Earth creationists to cope with the signals, they have to suggest that the process simply sped up and that most of this was actually deposited in, you know, the years of Noah's flood, the year of Noah's flood, or the years directly afterwards. Because Noah's flood is usually where they cram in these crazy physics-defying processes like speeding up radioactive decay or speeding up continental drift in order to get Pangaea to its current position or Rodinia to Pangaea to its current position. Um, and those are speeding up Earth processes, right? Earth's physical radioactive decay or Earth's you know, tectonic plate movement. In this case, however, you're speeding up orbital mechanics. You're just changing physics again, but this time you're doing it at a scale where only Earth is zooming around the sun in its precession at a rate that is so fast and so ridiculously uh, untenable in the sense that it just breaks math that I suppose it's no wonder they've not covered it. Because the problem actually gets a little bit worse. Creationists suppose that only the fossils and the geologic column that spans the Precambrian, or rather the Cambrian, to the uh, Cretaceous are, are, are deposited during Noah's Flood. Which means that these signals, which occurred over the past 120-odd thousand years, 160,000 years, were probably, in their opinion, deposited when humans were out wandering about. Because this is Cenozoic. Right, this is Cenozoic rock, which they think is all post-flood, which means that humans were around, in their opinion, for this rapid speed up of Earth's precession around the sun, moving mu multiple times faster than it's currently moving. And they would have noticed this because this would have changed the stars that they see in the sky. And we have records of these people groups, and we know that their stars were pretty much the same as the ones that we see today. So point being, the Earth did not speed up in its procession around the sun. It has been moving at the same speed that it's always been moving, which is why we get these nice cyclic intervals that validate the orbital monsoon hypothesis. And what that means is that the tilt of the Earth and its precession completely precludes young Earth creationism unless they can figure out some way to get these uh, 20, 23,000 year, excuse me, I keep switching between 23 and 26,000, it's 23,000 uh, year interval signals. They need to get them and they need to get them fast and they need to get them fast in a way that doesn't actually just have God, you know, flicking the earth and sending it zooming around the sun. And it's not just the cave deposits that are informed, right, by this orbital monsoon procession. 
And the orbital monsoon hypothesis and the orbital monsoon precession occurs at these 23,000 uh, year cycles, unlike the full precession, which occurs at 26,000 year cycles, just to be clear. But this, this specific process also influences the seasons, which means it influences things like po relative pollen amount in VARVs. It influence it influences rather glaciation. So how far do the glaciers retreat inward and outward? Um, and this precession, this wobble of the earth as it moves is pretty insurmountable as far as I can tell to a 6,000 year time frame as well as all its respective signals. With the fact that the nature of Earth's orbit precludes a 6,000 year Earth out of the way, uh, I would like to present reason number two, which may surprise some of you. I think another thing that really makes young Earth creationism impossible is actually soft tissue found in dinosaur remains. The reason I say that this might be surprising is because the soft tissue found in dinosaur bones is usually used by young earth creationists as a reason to support the idea that the earth is very young. They suggest that the work of evolutionary uh, creationists or theistic evolutionists, so a, a Christian who accepts evolutionary theory in the ancient age of the earth, the work by Mary Schweitzer, who is theistic evolutionist uh, and has found uh, sort of the soft tissue in dinosaur bones means that the earth simply must be young because if dinosaurs are supposed to be 65 million years old or indeed significantly older, we shouldn't be finding these soft tissues in their remains, right? They should all have degraded away by now. It should be 100% impossible. And that means that these dinosaurs actually died comparatively recently. And by comparatively recently, I mean um, 6,000 years ago or earlier. And you'll usually see that they say we found like dinosaur blood or stretchy blood vessels. They tend to characterize the soft tissue that we find as like you crack open a dinosaur bone and like soft marrow just spills out of it. That is not at all what has been found. Instead, we have looked in the four corners of sort of the, um, uh, the, the epiphyses of bones and we found there to be traces of biological matter, right? Usually dinosaur bones aren't bones anymore. They're permineralized rock, right? So it's, or permineralized bone. They've under, they're bones that have gone under, undergone permineralization. They've gone from being bone to being replaced by rock. So how is it that we actually do find soft tissue? And why is this not only not problematic for the ancient age of the earth, but in fact, actually preclusionary to young earth creationism? And for that, I would like to turn to a text written by Dr. Fuzz Rana. I brought it up here on the channel before. Dr. Fuzz Rana is actually an older creationist. He's not a theistic evolutionist. Um, and the reason why he has a problem with soft tissue being used to sort of support young earth creationism and why he actually wrote a whole book about it with his background, he got a PhD in chemistry with an emphasis in biochemistry, is because of which biomolecules are being preserved. Because... Dr. Rana notes in his book, Dinosaur Blood and the Age of the Earth, which I recommend if you find any of this kind of stuff interesting, he notes that the kinds of things that we're finding preserved are all the most robust biomolecules that we know of. It's always things like collagen, keratin, chitin, heme, eumelanin, etc. that are going to be what we find preserved in these dinosaur bones. Um, which creates a very interesting sort of issue that I want to discuss with you. First, let's discuss very briefly with Dr. Rana notes on how these kinds of organic structures can actually be preserved. And he supports the fact that these can indeed be preserved in rare and specific circumstances that he knows that this is supported by lab experiments that have been done by sort of these, these paleontologists who are interested in preservation. Rana also notes that all of the finds that have been put forward by credible scientists into peer-reviewed journals have one of two properties. They, one, have an extensive cross-linking present, or two, they have a chemical makeup that is similar to graphite, which is the most thermodynamically stable structure possible for an organic molecule. So this would, you know, both of these would kind of cover the guys that we discussed earlier, right? Things like heme, keratin, chitin, collagen, etc. And Rana notes that that presence of iron is going to be really key for a lot of these and that a lot of the characteristics that that tend to be common for these soft tissue finds do involve 
uh, iron being present in the sample. And the reason this is important is because Mary Schweitzer, the first person who came forward and, and talked about maybe finding this soft tissue, thought that iron was important too, and so she did an experiment. She took ostrich bones, which are of course very similar to dinosaur bones, and she stuck them in two solutions, one which contained hemoglobin or iron, um, and one which was just pure water. And after two years, she checked on them, and the one in hemoglobin was just indistinguishable from its original status, and nothing had changed. Uh, and the one in water had completely fallen apart. So iron is very important for actually preserving these things. Um, and all the, already the chemicals that, the biomolecules rather, that are going to be preserved are always these very robust molecules to begin with. But it's also important, and Rana really hammers this point quite well, it's important to note that what was actually found is not what's been published by creationists. He says, paleontologists have not recovered intact proteins such as collagen, keratin, and hemoglobin, but instead fragments of these molecules. And he compares it to the nature of finding a dinosaur bone and claiming that it's actually a bone instead of a, a permineralized sort of cast of a bone that's made of rock. Schweitzer and her fellow researchers did not discover blood vessels, but chemically transformed, chemically cross-linked structures derived from original blood vessels, yet still retaining their original shape. Some of these structures are flexible, but as Schweitzer discovered when surveying dinosaur remains for soft tissue remnants, others are crystallized and inflexible. She also had to apply chemicals to get them to actually flex and move. And this is material that, as Rana has noted, you, you can find this in her original publications. It's stuff that it's seems some young earth creationists have chosen to ignore, and ignore in favor of non-applicable studies instead. Brian Thomas, who is a classic young earth creationist and not convinced at all by the preservation mechanisms proposed by the secular community, uses the laws of thermodynamics to say that it is impossible for these tissues to actually persist. He actually cites a study that notes that at best, only 1% of original collagen can remain in a bone after 700,000 years, which is of course a bit shy of the 65 million years that we need as the secular community for it to actually persist, or conventional scientific community. But Rana dug into this, and he actually found out that the site, the source rather, that, that uh, Brian Thomas is citing to say that only this much collagen can remain after 700,000 years uh, was testing degradation under conditions akin to boiling water. Like that's the temperatures that they were using, uh, specifically 194 degrees Fahrenheit or 90 degrees Celsius, which is perhaps not the conditions that the conventional scientific community is proposing that these dinosaur bones were actually preserved under. In fact, I don't think creationists are supposing that either. So why is he using a study that is completely non-relevant? because it gives him the buzz sentence that he needs to say that the preservation mechanisms proposed by conventional scientists don't work. Now, I mentioned earlier that lab experiments have been done on the role of iron preservation on these very robust biomolecules, because again, we're not talking about fragile biomolecules that you know we find in other organisms that have you know died 10,000 years ago, which we'll get there in a second. Um, but there's also been work on sort of the structural stability of some of these biomolecules. It turns out that the kinds that we're finding are not only very tightly packed and kind of squirreled away in the corners and the recesses rather of these bones, but workers from China, Denmark, and Mary Schweitzer herself have also seemingly found that they're unusually stable, which may be a result of this very specific and rare type of preservation mechanism that you get when you combine cross-linking with iron. But I think it's very interesting the nature of how these things have preserved and how they could indeed preserve, how it kind of maps with what we would expect from a conventionally scientific perspective, right? If you are a conventional scientist, you would expect that if you find soft tissues in these remains, they should be one, very scant, they should be rare, and this is indeed the case. Two, they should be very degraded, which as Rana noted, they are. They're not, they're not these full stretchy tissues as is being proposed by younger creationists, but rather they're sort of casts of tissues almost with just the barest bit of, of biological signature still to them. And three, they should be of the most robust biomolecules. They shouldn't be things like DNA, which would be far more breakable and easy to degrade into nothing. And this is, of course, what we find. What would creationists expect then? And herein lies the problem, because if you are a young earth creationist, then you suppose the vast majority of the fossils in the fossil record from the Cambrian to the Cretaceous were deposited during Noah's flood. When God flooded the earth 4,400 years ago, all of these critters died under the same exact 
conditions. So why then does it scale with conventional science's time? Why does it scale with deep time? Why is there a bias? Why can we pull full genomes from Neanderthals who lived 40,000 years ago, but we can't get a lick of DNA from dinosaurs or Anomalocaris even? This is very strange because, again, they think that all of these guys died roughly around the same time, but it seems to match with evolutionary time scales. If the young earth creationists are correct, and the earth is 6,000 years old and most of the geologic column and fossil record was deposited 4,400 years ago, soft tissue shouldn't be occasionally found. It should be ubiquitous. It should be found in every fossil specimen, regardless of where it lands in the conventional time scale. You should be able to pull just as much from Anomalocaris and from uh, Eusthenopteron and from Miocene apes, if you're going to push it into the Pleistocene for the flood boundary, as you can from a Neanderthal. And you should be able to find as much in the Tyrannosaurus rex as well. It shouldn't scale with time. And yet it does. And this means that soft tissue kind of does preclude young earth creationism. It provides direct opposite evidence to the idea that all of these critters were buried under the same conditions during the single year of Noah's flood and instead suggests a myriad of different conditions through deep time. Next on our list for preclusionary issues for young earth creationism is going to be plankton. Plankton are, of course, microorganisms that live in the water. They come in zooplankton varieties, they can be phytoplankton, and there are a lot of them. Again, I've done a video on this one too, so I'll put that in the description so you can go and get like a nice heaping helping of why this is problematic, but I'm going to give you the quick version now. There's a lot of plankton in the ocean. We have about 45 billion tons worth of biomass every year just today. And there is presumably, at least according to studies that we've done on planktonic diversity, there's actually less plankton today than there used to be. So this number actually is higher the deeper you go into the geologic column. It crests around the Cretaceous and then it's sort of low again earlier than that. But again, young earth creationists typically tend to put the flood as a year-long event that happened and deposited everything that we see from the Cambrian to the Cretaceous. So all of the life, death, and diversity of plankton has to happen during that time. And this is problematic because if we have 45 billion tons worth of plankton today, every year, you're cramming, you know, 200 odd million years into a single year of the flood. And that would be so much planktonic biomass that the flood of Noah's day would just be like a mushy, giant amoebic sea mess of plankton. It would There would be no room for water. It would be nothing but plankton. This is just a sludge of microorganisms that is making up a gigantic ocean that covers the entire planet. It's insane. There is just absolutely no way to make that work. But it actually gets worse than that because it's not just the biomass that's the problem. It's also the fact that plankton comes in fresh and saltwater varieties, and we find them living and evolving throughout the entire geologic column. Now, why is this problematic? Because if you have a giant flood that covers the entire Earth, the salinity is going to equalize. And since plankton is very sensitive, you would either have the extinction of every kind of freshwater plankton, and then at some point during the geologic column, it's just all saltwater plankton, or the opposite. It's going to be mostly freshwater, and all the saltwater plankton is going to go extinct. But instead, we can identify paleo environments of old lakes throughout time, ancient oceans through time, and we can see that these plankton of salt and freshwater varieties are just living, dying, and evolving through the column. We don't see them mixing together as if there was a giant ocean that covered the entire planet. As I've said before, creationists suggest that the sea just stratified into salt and freshwater varieties, like you have big patches during the flood of like salt water and big patches of freshwater. That's not how density works. <laughs> and over the course of the year of the flood, eventually salt water would be all on the bottom and fresh water would be all on the top. And this would be pretty much the most obvious sign in the geologic column that a, f a giant global flood occurred. But we don't see that. So plankton is problematic because of its massive amount of biomass that would create an amoebic sludge over the you know entire surface of the planet. It's problematic because these guys are evolving through the geologic column. Their lifespan is like two to five days, so there's just absolutely no way that you can see that kind of evolutionary change. 
Um, and then there's also the issue of the salt and fresh water varieties. It doesn't work no matter how you cut it. Number four is human genetics. I realize that's a very broad topic, but for me, human genetics is very problematic for young earth creationism for a few reasons. Number one is obviously the fact that there is nothing unique about humans, genetically speaking, that removes us from the animal kingdom. We are, of course, primates, and we are respectively closer to uh, various groups of primates that lands us within hominids. We're the closest to chimpanzees, and they're the closest to us, having shared 98.8% of our coding base pairs and 96% when we're comparing the genome with indels included. This is a whole lot, and this is more than, say, rats share with mice, which means creationists want to consider those two the same kind. Obviously, humans and chips have to be the same kind, too, if we're being uniform and using standard methods like a good scientist would do. But human genetics is also problematic for other reasons, and that's the fact that we've recovered archaic genomes from other hominin species and from very old humans. Recently, there was a very nice paper published that I want to go over very briefly here because I think that it's going to be very Rocky for our friend Nathaniel Jensen. So this is a pretty recent paper uh, that just came out from February 25th, 2022, so like last week, and it's titled The Unified Genealogy of Modern and Ancient Genomes. Now the workload on this thing is insane, and I've not seen a response from Answers in Genesis or anything like that just yet, but uh, it, <laughs> needless to say, this is going to be problematic, and I'm going to explain why. So what they did is they created a unified tree sequence of 3,601 modern and then eight high coverage ancient human genomes from numerous different data sets. All right, this is pretty big as far as, um, as far as creating a family tree. In fact, it's been dubbed in pop science articles as the biggest family tree ever created. What they also did is they calculated the distribution of the time to the most recent common ancestry between 215 populations of the constituent data sets, revealing patterns consistent with substantial variation in historical population size and evidence of archaic admixture in modern humans. Um, this is a huge, huge paper. Um, it's very big. But what you should immediately see uh, and be able to infer from just this very cool, nice uh, graphic here uh, is the humans originated and evolved in Africa, um, not the Middle East. So this out of the Middle East thing that Answers in Genesis has been pushing uh, is going to be blown out of the water by this paper. Um, it is blown out of the water by this paper, I suppose I should say. And I want to cover this at sort of a, a, in a deeper level later on, but I really like this because not only does it discuss, you know, where humans kind of emerged from, and it's going to discuss here in just a moment, um, as you can see, it's it's pretty robust. They also include Neanderthals and Denisovans, which Nathaniel Jensen of Answers in Genesis will not utilize. He thinks that they are too um, they're too degraded as genomes. Uh, boy, I wonder I wonder when genomes stop being too degraded to use. Do you suppose it's perhaps around I don't know six thousand years? So <laughs> anyways, I, I sort of digress. I'm sort of looking for something specific here. In this genealogy, numerous features of human history are immediately apparent, such as the deep divergence of archaic and modern humans and the effects of the Out of Africa event, as well as a subtle increase in Oceanian and Denisovan's most recent common ancestor density from 2,000 to 5,000 generations ago. So they show sort of how these trees are interconnected uh, and how, how human growth rates have changed throughout time. I'm looking for kind of a specific section here. Um, this might be what I'm looking for. I'm gonna have to edit this out. It's gonna be really annoying if I remember to even edit it out. You guys know I sometimes forget <laughs> to, uh, to do some proper editing, um, which is why I'm kind of babbling now. Uh, let me see here. Here it is. All right. So as you can see, out of Africa is, is robustly you know, supported by this uh, paper. It says, by 280,000 years ago, the estimated geographic center of human ancestors is still located in Africa, but many ancestors are also observed in the Middle East and Central Asia, and a few are located in Papua New Guinea. At 140,000 years ago, more ancestors found in Papua New Guinea. This is almost 100,000 years before the earliest documented human habitation of the region. And then they say, however, our findings are potentially consistent with the proposed timescales of deeply diverged Denisovan lineages specific to the Papuans. Um, and they talk about later in this paper how it's very interesting because it does indeed seem like their work corroborates the timing of the human and non-human hominin fossils that we find and where we find them, both in places like Java and leaving Africa, which is super duper cool. 
But it's certainly not good that the largest family tree uh, in, in the history of research on this subject and the largest genealogy with the biggest data set possible not only corroborated the fossil record, but indeed showed that we do in fact come out of Africa, not out of the Middle East, which is where Genesis firmly places a literal Eden. So human genetics, both in the sense that we are related to all of the other life on this planet, which I mostly covered in the last video, but also in relation to kind of general modern population genetics, uh, is going to be problematic. And I'm going to include some links in, in this sort of this section of the video where I cover things like why is the human Y chromosome so divergent from the chimpanzee Y chromosome? What about the human chromosome two fusion, right? This is something we talk about all the time that creationists are really, really trying hard to debunk. I've, I've covered a lot of you know their attempts to do that. So I'll link that in description as well. For my last topic, um, for this next sort of set of preclusionary points and topics, I picked plants and uh, yeah, just plants, wholesale plants, because they are problematic in just about every possible way uh, that a subject can be problematic. Any way you look at them, at any point in the Young Earth Creation sort of timeline, plants are there mucking it up. And I'm going to kind of tell you what I mean here in a second, because there's a bit to get into. The first thing you need to know is that Young Earth Creationists rarely talk about plants unless they're talking about, like, did plants have thorns in the Garden of Eden? They kind of just ignore them more, you know, after that, which is weird, because, like, they have plant geneticists on staff. But the first Plants create problems from like square one, right? So plants are created before the sun is created. So, you know, one has to ask the question, what, what, how are the plants alive without the sun to kind of nourish them? That's a bit nonsensical. There's the problem of creationists supposing there's no death in the Garden of Eden before humans sinned. So they use that to suggest that all animals were vegetarian before, you know, the fall of man, and then they start eating meat once they get expelled from the garden. There is no theological basis I've talked about for any of this, which I've talked about before. Um, but it's also interesting because, like, I've talked about this too. Well, what did die in the Garden of Eden? Because things had to eat, so were they eating, like, plants? Yes, because they're all vegetarians. But they define alive versus dead by using this term called nefesh, which is like the breath of life. So if it draws air into its lungs, then it is considered uh, conventionally alive, which is like a weird statement to say. They also use this for, you know, raising a saying God didn't have Noah bring insects or arthropods on the ark because they don't breathe in a conventional way. Um, they use book lungs, right, and spiracles, so technically Noah didn't have to bring them on. Um, and of course, plants obviously don't have lungs either. But Nevertheless, plants, just like arthropods and just like fish, all respire. They still breathe in the sense that they engage in gas exchange. So if we're using nefesh as like having lungs, that feels a bit weird because it means the breath of life. So do they breathe? Kind of. Um, it's a, there's a fine line there, but then again, I guess we're arguing about like applying the, an ancient word's definition to a nonsensical interpretation of the world. So I guess we do need to kind of take that into consideration. Uh, but the fact is plants had to die in the garden and plants do breathe. So I don't know how they decide what is alive and what is dead. Like what is considered death really? Did cells die in the garden? Did no one like step on ants? Does that count? Um, and all that is a bit strange. More problematic than that though, is the fact that Noah did not take any plants on the ark and a worldwide flood would kill every plant on the planet if it lasted for a year. If it lasted for a month, it would kill every plant on the planet. This is because plants don't have very good salinity tolerance, right? Plants that are not like literally mangrove trees are going to die if they're submerged in salt water for a year. Uh, and you might be thinking, well, has anyone tested that? Uh, and the answer to this is yes. Here is a paper titled Salt Tolerance and Salinity Effects on Plants a review, which is, you know, when you see review in a paper, it's, it's probably going to be pretty beefy. Uh, because reviews usually, usually act as kind of lit reviews, so they attempt to kind of summarize the current status of understanding in a given subject. So if you scroll down past all of the details and the minutiae here, which I'm not a plant person, so a lot of it kind of went over my head, uh, you can mosey on down to the conclusion, which is, uh, you know, I'll, I'll just read it to you. In conclusion, salinity is the most serious threat to agriculture and to the environment in many parts of the world, and a key mo and key molecular factors that can be used for genetic engineering of salt tolerant plants include overexpression of specific transcription factors, characterization of dihydrin proteins, overproduction of uh, osmoprotectants. 
osmoprotectants, yeah, uh, expression of water channel proteins and ion transporters and expression and characterization of molecular chaperones. So what this means is that, um, yes, we know that plants are very intolerant to salt water to the extent that it is considered the most serious threat to agriculture and the environment today in many parts of the world. Um, so that's going to kind of deep six the flood story right there, especially because part of Noah knowing that the flood is over is that the dove brings him an olive branch, suggesting that an olive tree survived being submerged the entirety of the flood a whole year. That, to our knowledge, cannot happen. So you can say that that's miraculous, um, which is what I would do if I was a younger creationist. In fact, I would just say that the whole flood is miraculous. Then you can get rid of the heat problem too, which is going to be, if you're new here, the heat problem is a biggie, link in the description. Um, but yeah, so the, the plants are going to be problematic uh, because they're not going to survive the flood. None of them can. And you might say, okay, well, what if he did just take seeds on the ark? Because I used to know a guy who said, oh, and obviously he took seeds. He had to have taken seeds because the plants wouldn't survive. So seeds had to be taken on the ark. Okay, cool. Uh, so what did the herbivores eat, right, when they came off the ark? Because, you know, the Bible talks about how the animals get off the ark and they disperse. Okay, <laughs> what did they eat? <laughs> You guys got to give some answers here, right? If you're going to if you're going to treat this as like a real thing, you have to have some answers to some of this con some of these concepts. Um I've heard floating mats of vegetation okay. Um that's kind of weird because everything is supposed to be submerged, right? Um floating mats of vegetation seems like very ad hoc to me, but even then you're not going to get a representative of every single kind of plant on a floating mat of vegetation. Some of them are so sensitive that they can only live in very arid environments and any level of rain is going to botch them. So that's not going to work either in order to get all the diversity of plants that we have today. Um, and then on top of all this, we have an additional problem that plants in general represent, and that's going to be dendrochronology. Because if you count tree rings, you can actually go back quite far. So here is a paper titled Testing and Verified Old Age Evidence, and it's by Ken Wolgameth, Dr. Wolgameth, who's been on the channel before, and Greg Davidson. Now, the cool thing about this is Ken basically is trying to figure out whether or not uh, different kinds of dating actually validate each other. So first, what these guys do is they describe what tree ring dating is. So dendrochronology is the process of counting rings within trees and looking for specific markers within those rings to try and find out, you know, basically how far back we can go and identify, like I said, uh, a given drought or maybe a, a time period of intense rain, things like that. And you can use living trees and go back so far, but then you can cross corroborate certain rings like those drought rings or heavy rain rings with uh, even older trees that are used in things like buildings, ancient buildings um, and things like that, and then old forests as well. And that can go back pretty far, but Ken wanted to take it to the next level. So what he did is he said, all right, we're gonna count the tree rings and we're gonna cross it with carbon dating of those rings uh, as well as varves. So varves are these sort of uh, seasonal depositions of um, sediment in lakes, right? Um, usually on like the, the uh, coasts of lakes. And what's really cool about this is he overlays them with each other. First, he does it with tree rings and carbon dating, and you find that the tree ring and its respective carbon date fit a perfect slope, just like what would be expected if carbon dating were in fact accurate. So carbon dating is validated uh, by tree rings, the accuracy of carbon dating is. So, you know, if you count back 4,000 tree rings and date the 4,000th tree ring, the carbon date will show approximately 4,000 years, which is really cool. But then, of course, he compared it to varves as well. Uh, and you can actually get, go back 14,000 years using tree rings, varves, and carbon-14 dating. Three completely independent methods, one using organic matter, one using geology, and one using the processes of physical decay, of nuclear decay within organic matter which is really problematic and Ken kind of notes it here. He says, these results mean one of two things. Because Ken is an old earth creationist. He says, either God was superintending one sediment couplet per year so that it only appears that the varves are depositing at the same rate as the tree rings. Uh, and at the same time, tree rings were adding one growth ring per 11,000 years, or God manipulated unrelated and independent processes uh, each and every year, atmospheric carbon-14 decay, decay with some sediment couplets per year in a precise manner over a much more abbreviated time frame, such that they are indistinguishable 
from the expectations of conventional geology. So Ken is like, this is going to be very difficult to explain if you're a young earth creationist, why three completely independent on unrelated methods are yielding this 14,000 date, and they can be corroborated at specific points. And what's really cool about that is he said, okay, well, let's see, you know, what kind of specific point we can arbitrarily pick. And he chose the Dead Sea Scrolls. So he notes that carbon-14 can be, uh, carbon-14 dating can be utilized on the Dead Sea Scrolls to get the age, and that you can find the specific tree ring date of that Dead Sea Scroll, right, in within the tree rings. And you can also look at argon argon ash, um, as well. So this is really cool. Um, and he, you know, takes the conclusion and notes contrary to young earth claims that historical science is not a real science because it cannot be tested. He says, uh, God has given us amazing tools for testing hypotheses and assumptions about the unobserved past. Tree ring growth, atmospheric carbon-14 production, radioactive decay rates, sediment couplets, and ash chemistry are all independent phenomena. Combining these independent methods allows a rigorous comparison of conventional and young earth models. The data in total fit amazingly well with conventional geolog geologic understanding, requiring no disruptions of natural laws or unfathomably improbable alignments of unrelated processes. Even accurate biblical dates of artifacts are possible with conventional understanding. In contrast, the young earth model can explain the data only by calling upon a host of unrelated processes aligning in a perfect synchronization to coincidentally match conventional expectations it requires supernatural manipulation of nature with no apparent purpose other than to mislead uh, and then kent finishes sorry kent oh, sorry ken that was not nice of me at all you're not at all similar to any kents that i know then he finishes by saying many in the world marvel at the handiwork of God while denying the creator. In response, young earth advocates demand to that to acknowledge the creator, we must deny his workmanship. Can there be a more ineffective witness? And I think that this is just incredibly apt. Um, I think many people leave the church. I myself am an agnostic, but I do think that many people do leave the church because they're told that they cannot accept conventional science uh, and also maintain their religious beliefs. So I, I share, you know, I'm, I'm sympathetic towards Ken here. Um, and he's also an excellent scientist and he himself and uh, Greg, I believe it's Greg, yes, Greg Davidson have done an excellent job here. I think then that the nature of plants as a whole, <laughs> plants, the kingdom, create massive insurmountable problems for young earth creationism and in a variety of different ways. Obviously in the Garden of Eden, their presence leads to bizarre interpretations. They don't know how to deal with plants. Are plants truly alive in the sense that other organisms are? Of course they are, but they have to find weird workarounds so they can have their vegetarian Tyrannosaurus Rex munching away on melons and celery. In the case of the Noachian deluge, it creates a preclusion because there simply is no way that any plant could survive being underwater in salt water for over a year, or in fresh water, actually, for that matter. This is not doable, and until they can demonstrate that any kind of plant could survive full submersion uh, and then go on to diversify into the myriad of different plants that we see today, because obviously all the plants won't survive, so it has to be one that then diversifies into the plants uh, of the modern era. Until they can show that, then plants during the Noachian deluge act as a preclusionary topic. You, you can't get around it. It's problematic uh, because obviously there are plants here today. So their presence creates a massive hurdle for them. And then lastly, dendrochronology and its respective ties to things like varve dating, carbon-14 dating, and the dating of ash layers additionally create something rather insurmountable. You can't get past the fact that independent ways of measuring the age of the earth get you much older than 6,000 years. And if you take into account things like ice cores or indeed normal radiometric dating, well, <laughs> the problem indeed deepens. It goes from 14,000 or 160,000 years to, you know, the, the classic conventional 4.5 to 4.8 billion. So plants do indeed in their various ways preclude young earth creationism. They have to deal with all three of those things. How do you invalidate dendrochronology, right? How do you get the plants to survive the flood? And what is the true nature of these plants in the Garden of Eden, logically speaking? Now you might be thinking, okay, well, I'm sure they've got responses to uh, the dendrochronology thing, and they do, but, um, Ken, Dr. Wolgamuth, has done an impeccable job answering all of these in the paper that I just cited, right? So he takes each 
uh, counter to dendro chronology and tackles them one by one. So I will cite that in the description, probably, and you can check it out there. And I highly recommend it. He's a great guy, great scientist. And so we've got the axial tilt and wobble of the Earth precluding young Earth creationism by the fact that various different kinds of seasonal signals are impossible to uh, speed up because you would have to speed up the orbit of the Earth around the sun in order to uh, in order to argue that and by several times over because it's not like we get these signals two times we get them dozens of times throughout the rock record uh, in the case of soft tissue the fact that this the type of fragile soft tissue that we find in conventional science recently deceased organisms over the past 40,000 years, the fact that we don't find that ubiquitously across all life that is supposed to have died during the flood is enormously problematic and it shows an extremely large hole for their use of soft tissue as a support for them, especially when it, of course, does exactly the opposite. Uh, in the case of our plankton, this is also going to be preclusionary because you've got massive amounts of biomass. An amoebic sledge of an ocean is what Noah is sailing the boat in. If you have uh, all of the geologic columns plankton representation living at the same time during a single year, this is going to be impossible. But they also have to explain how the plankton were not just present, but living, dying, and evolving in fresh and salt water, respectively, because we know that the ocean can't stratify. This I've talked about this at length in other videos but it's just not something that can happen. Uh, either going to get all salt water on the top or all salt water on the bottom due to density differentials. The fourth thing was human genetics, the fact that we're incredibly closely related to other apes, but more importantly, the fact that we do indeed nest within Africa and we have an ancient divergent state. This is going to be very hard for the folks like Nathaniel Jensen overcome, and we're going to see how he handles it in his new book that's coming out here in March called Traced. I'm very excited uh, to kind of sink my teeth into that as well. And the last thing that we talked about was plants, which I mentioned at the beginning. So my gentlemen, of course, very modern apes. I hope you enjoyed this sort of quick video. Um, I'm now in my PJs, as you can kind of see. Uh, it's storming outside, very spooky, kind of like young earth creationism. Uh, but I hope you enjoyed this. This was, like I said, it's, it's a quick video, mostly just because I, I have to have these nice little fillers on weeks I've got a lot going on in kind of uh, normal regular IRL life so my gentle of course very modern apes I hope you enjoyed this and please do take care of yourselves sorry that was all very redundant I am exhausted to be quite honest with you